and welcome to Entipedia. Today we are going to explain the basics of perimeter security, an upcoming concept that integrates several elements and systems to protect a network's perimeter in order to detect intrusion attempts and even to dissuade potential attackers. It's a very interesting topic. Come with us. Hello Bob, the new company at iWorker has asked me to evaluate the perimeter security measures of their computer network's architecture and to recommend ways of improving it. They have given me this diagram, which shows that all the computers are connected directly to the internet through a router, and I believe this could cause some problems. So they want me to provide solutions to achieve a secure network. They have suggested that I should begin separating the services they offer through the internet which suffer more attacks from the rest of the network and place them in a special segment called DMZ Demilitarized Zone. This way, if the attackers gain access to any of the computers, they won't be able to access the rest of the network. How can I do this? Alice, it is typical to separate services that are accessible through the internet, like a company's website or their email, from their local network or entrain it. In this way, demilitarized zones are very useful a DMZ is usually created with a device called a firewall. This device is designed to filter both inbound and outbound traffic. If you install a firewall and separate the public services from the entrained, the new architecture would look like this. If you look closely, you will see that traffic from the entrained and the DMZ towards the internet is allowed. But the firewall blocks all the requests it receives towards the entrained, regardless of its origin. It will only accept traffic towards the DMZ from those services for which it has been configured. Of course, with this method, if something were to happen to one of the servers inside the DMZ, the intruder would be isolated. But, how does a firewall work? Firewalls follow some rules. There are two philosophies which define them. On one hand we have a permissive policy that accepts all traffic except whichever is specifically denied and on the other hand, we have a restrictive policy that denies all traffic except whichever is specifically accepted. The latter policy requires higher maintenance but is more secure, so it should always be used. Generally speaking, we can classify firewalls into four types, according to their features and the layers of the OSI model on which they work. First we have gateway firewalls, which work for specific applications like Telnet. FTP or web. Second, we have network layer firewalls, also called packet filters, which can be configured based on IP addresses and source and destination ports. Third, we have application layer firewalls that understand and analyze specific protocols like HTTP and filter requests following specific patterns or behaviors. Finally, we have personal firewalls, like Zone Alarm and Comodo Pro, for example, which are used in desktop computers. For a better understanding of these rule-based devices, let's take a look at an example of a network layer firewall, which you would find useful in your situation. For instance, we could have a firewall with a rule indicating that the network range 172.16.0.0.16 can access the SMTP server, port 25, with IP address 192.168.0.4 and the web service, port 80, with address 192.168.0.2. Another rule could state that any address can have access to another web service at the address 192.168.10.8. Of course, the rest of the connections would be denied. Thanks Bob, now I begin to realize how powerful these devices are. I'll take them into consideration. Bob, after considering the use of firewalls, 
How should I continue? Well, the truth is that there are still many security measures that you can apply, for example, installing an intrusion detection system. These are used to identify attacks in real time, store registries and report to the administration and security staff so they can adopt extra security measures. Well well, another device. It looks like a very complex but unproductive system if the only thing it does is report attack. Don't go jumping to conclusions, Alice. The IDS is very worthy, as a journal and can be a good starting point, to identify the origin of an attack. Furthermore, the IDS have evolved to Intrusion Detection and Prevention Systems IDPS. They are one of the most complex elements able to block connections, when they detect a dangerous event, in the same way as application firewalls do. That's very interesting. Now I wonder, where should I connect it? And how can it identify an attack from a non-attack? An intrusion detection and prevention system has the following architecture. A group of sensors are installed to inform about anomalies in the elements under study. An example of these sensors is the ones in host-based intrusion detection systems HIDS. These monitor the changes made inside a computer, like changes in its operating system, configuration, registry and applications. Other types of ID systems are those based on network sensors, network intrusion detection systems, and IDS, that install a sensor in each segment of the network that is being monitored. The NIDS can work in two different ways. The most common method is to analyze the network traffic and compare it with a signature database, so if there are any matches, it alerts the administrator. The other option is to register the traffic during a period of time and create a behavior pattern. Afterwards, all the received packets are compared with the initial pattern, alerting when something is different. Here is a simple signature for you to see how it works. In this example, you can see in the first line how it is identified, for what interface, protocol and service the signature would be checked. The second line identifies the message that would be sent, as an alert, if as shown in the third and fourth line, an established connection is found with a string printer, inside a web URI uniform resource identifier request. The last lines show, the references to, this vulnerability and other identification and classification data. But. I suppose the signature database is updated frequently so new attacks can be detected quickly, right? Of course, the systems and the general security configuration must be updated permanently. Signatures are very effective for detecting attacks very quickly, but there are other technologies to learn about new trends and techniques used by intruders. For this purpose, honeypots are very useful. A honeypot can be software or a group of computers used to attract attackers. For this purpose, they are installed and configured with great breaches, so they can be easily violated. When the intruders enter, all their actions are controlled and monitored in order to improve the security architecture. This seems pretty dangerous. Where are the vulnerabilities defined? In the operating system or in the applications? Moreover, what vulnerabilities are used? That's true. These traps have risks and therefore require a lot of work to ensure that their isolation and disconnection from the main networks is complete. This is one of the main reasons why they are not widely used. In terms of vulnerabilities, it depends on the type of honeypot. There are two types, low interaction honeypots, which simulate the operating system and applications, and high interaction honeypots, which present breaches in the services. An example of this could be something as simple as establishing an easy password like 1, 2, 3, 4 for the root user of an FTP or ASS8. So, when they try to enter, they are caught. Exactly. And with them, we obtain samples of new vulnerabilities, worms, spam emails and all those things we don't want in our network. Bob. There is something that I don't understand. Within the security perimeter, could we establish some kind of solution to the network architecture to avoid harmful content, such as malware or spam, from reaching the computers in my company? As well as an antivirus in each of the workstations, the organization should have an antivirus and anti-spam gateway to receive all the emails, process them, and then deliver them to the traditional email server if they are clean. The users would then download the emails as usual. This will be very useful, since we receive a lot of junk mail, 
that may contain malware. Sometimes these come from employees who send them from home unknowingly. Many of our workers check their mail on the internet or access internal applications when they telework. And not only that, there are also some branches of our company in other cities that connect to our network. I see. Alice, as well as analyzing the information exchanged in your company, you may want to secure communications and protect the information when using a public infrastructure like the internet by means of a virtual private network VPN. With it you can encapsulate and encrypt all the traffic in a new virtual network. Virtual private networks ensure data authentication and integrity and the authorization of each user. In addition, these networks minimize the external exposure of internal services avoiding their violation. Thanks Bob. Now I can go back to work with all these remarks. I'll keep you posted on how things go. Good morning, Bob. We have redesigned the network architecture and have made many changes taking into account the security aspects we discussed previously. Well, hello, Alice. I'm glad to hear that. Tell me exactly what you have done. After studying the costs, the company purchased a unified threat management system that includes multiple security features, firewalls, intrusion detection and prevention systems and a virus and any spam gateways and virtual private networks. Well thought out. These devices are very useful for centralized solutions. How has the architecture been configured? I suppose you have an updated diagram. That's right. Here it is. Let me show it to you and explain all the changes we've made. The first thing we did was configure the firewall, segmenting the web services and the mail gateway and the DMZ with a restrictive policy. Then we set the intruder detection and prevention system to listen in the three interfaces for all possible attacks. With these changes, we have moved the database server beside the mail server inside the internal network, so they are not accessible from the internet. And now all the workers and branches will connect to them using a VPN. What a change! I can tell that you have studied the new design in depth now the architecture is much safer. Thanks for your advice. You're welcome. At the Entipedia website you will find further information on this interesting topic. In the meantime, I will stay here reviewing my IDS logs. Until the next lesson, goodbye. See you later.